Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Natalie, and on behalf of the White Museum, thank you for uh, joining us here for this month's book, book talk. Uh, the book talk series features authors who tell the stories of the Canadian Rockies and celebrate the White Museum's archives. Tonight, we're excited to feature Perlan Reichwein and her book, Uplift, Visual Culture at the Banff School of Fine Arts. There's a few instructions for tonight's presentation. Uh, we do ask everyone to stay muted and keep your video off for the presentation. If you do have any questions, please type them into the chat line. And after the presentation, uh, we will open up the floor to any questions. So before I begin, I would like to acknowledge that we live, work, and play on the tra traditional territories of the Stony Nakoda nations, the Bear Spa, Wesley, and Chiniki, the Blackfoot Confederacy, Siksika, Kenai, and Pekani, the Tsutina, part of the Dene people, the Tunaha, the Sep Sepwakmek, and the Mountain Cree and Métis. And we're grateful to be able to draw from the wisdom and guidance of the knowledge keepers of the Indigenous people of this area. Now I would like to invite Elizabeth Kundert Cameron, Head of Archives and Special Collections to introduce Pearl Ann. Hello everyone. I am thrilled to be introducing Pearl Ann Reifwine to you tonight. I'm standing here in the reference room where for over 30 years, Pearl Ann has been coming to do her research. I've worked in the archives for 22 of these years and I have witnessed firsthand Pearl Ann's thorough research skills and commitment to excellence. In the acknowledgement section of her 1995 PhD dissertation, Pearl Ann spoke of the archives as her second home in Banff, where she has always felt welcome. We hope she continues to feel that way, as we truly enjoy having Pearl Ann when she comes here to the archives. Pearl Ann Reichwine is a professor at the University of Alberta in the Faculty of Kinesiology, Sport and Recreation and was also, the, also a visiting professor at l'Université Gustave Eiffel in Paris, France. Pearl Ann's research program highlights Canada's social and environmental history, particularly in Western Canada and the mountain regions. Mountain parks and the Canadian national park idea are a key focus of her research, which integrates an understanding of the history of people, parks, and politics. Pearl Ann's commitment to the national park idea is also evident in her current involvement in an effort to create a national urban park in the North Saskatchewan River Valley in the city of Edmonton, Alberta and area. Her published articles in leading journals such as the Canadian Historical Review and the International Journal of the History of Sport have garnered numerous awards and honors, including the 2017 finalist for best article in the International Journal of the History of Sport. Her books, Mountain Diaries, The Alpine Adventures of Margaret Fleming, co-edited with Karen, Karen Fox, and the book Climber's Paradise, Making Canada's Mountain Parks, <clears throat> excuse me, were both finalists in their categories at the Banff Centre's Mountain Film and Book Festival in 2004 and 2014. Climber's Paradise also won the prestigious Canadian Historical Association Clio Prize in 2015. Her latest book, which we are going to be hearing about tonight, Uplift, Visual Culture at the Banff School of Fine Arts, is co-authored by Karen Wall. It explores art education and tourism in Banff National Park as influences on civil society and democracy. I love the story of the Banff Centre. It is a story of spirit and inspiration, having been founded in 1933 during the Great Depression. It is a presence in Banff that has supported both culture and the love of mountains, helping to bring additional vibrancy to our mountain home. I personally chose to live in Banff because of this vibrancy, a beautiful mountain community with a strong arts and culture presence. But at the same time, they're their own community, up on the side of Tunnel Mountain with the town of Banff below. I'm really looking forward to hearing about Perlan's insights into the Banff Center. And um, I guess that's it. Take it away, Perlan. Please welcome Perlan. Thank you. 
Well, thank you so much. Can you hear me all right? <laughs> yes. I'm speaking tonight from Edmonton near the University of Alberta campus, and we are on Treaty 6 territory in the homeland of the Métis First Nation Region 4. Thank you so much for your warm welcome. I really appreciate um, this invitation to Treaty 7 territories in the more southerly Métis homelands. And it's always a pleasure to be invited to the White Museum. I thank you for the invitation to speak. And I'm also delighted to be joined by my colleagues. Um, and thanks to all of you who are here to join us tonight for my book launch. Um, thank you for coming to this talk at the White. As a U of A professor who spent many student years in Banff, I am happy to be launching a new book this spring. And I'm delighted to hear from some of you that your paper uh, cover copies are now landing in the mail. This book is called Uplift. It's published by UBC Press and it's available through the White Museum in their museum shop online. It's just such a pleasure to launch my book, Uplift at the wonderful White Museum, the home of Catherine and Peter White for many years and the warm gathering place of creators and visitors through time. As a student, I had always wondered how the Banff School of Fine Arts came to be in this spectacular site in the middle of Banff and a national park. And I would stop on the bridge while I was crossing the Bow River and look up to the hill and think a little bit, wow, how did that get there? What an amazing story. I need to know more about that. Well, it evolved into today's Banff Center for Arts and Creativity on Tunnel Mountain or Sleeping or Sacred Buffalo Guardian Mountain and other names that it's known by in the Stony Nakota language. And it is in the midst of a UNESCO World Heritage Site, as we can see uh, one designated in 1984 in the Canadian Rockies. I have to say that over the years of my own travels back and forth between Edmonton and Banff as a student and then as a professor, I came to see that the idea did not begin in the Rockies alone, but also here with the idea of a public university. So our new book brings together both sides of this story and how the Banff School was an outreach of the U of A Extension Program for Adult Education, which emerged as the largest of its kind across Canada and was an incredibly large machine. Today, I want to share some of our book with you focused on the connection between public education and public parks for the early Banff School and its learning holidays that helped to brand Banff. Often we overlook urban history and also the role of the province of Alberta in shaping Banff. But the story of the Banff School reveals both the lives of art students and art teachers as tourists coming to Banff can tell us more and ultimately their holidays at school branded Banff as a cultural destination for learning in the Rockies. My talk today will touch on three things, the origins of the school and its campus, teachers and students, and finally branding Banff. So there's never anything so fun as teachers and students talking about teachers and students. So why don't we talk about their holidays in Banff and get this party started. Alberta was a poor province when it began in 1905. Premier Alexander Rutherford and the first government of Alberta believed that a public university was essential to advance society, the economy and the public good. Earliest among public universities created in Western Canada, U of A was also the first and only university for the whole province, later growing offshoots into the University of Calgary and other post-secondaries multiplied with time. The public university was considered vital because it offered knowledge and education to sustain a modern province and the advancement of its people. President Henry Marshall Tory said in the very first convocation speech in 1908, year one of the University of Alberta, 
that he was dedicated to uplifting the whole of the people. That was the purpose of the modern public university, and that's what the people demanded. His vision was also embedded with aspirations for a democratic society and serving the population in everyday life as close as possible to daily life. As he famously said in his first convocation speech, the modern state university is a people's institution. The people demand that knowledge shall not be the concern of scholars alone. The uplifting of the whole people shall be its final goal. In this spirit, Tory established the Department of Extension in 1912 to take the university on the road. The idea of university extension for adult education built on 19th century ideas emerging from Cambridge University's adult extension summer programs for those who otherwise would not have been admitted into university, such as women and workers. In the United States, you had other adult educators such as John Dewey. U of A Extension opened its doors and carried the university to the people wherever they lived, extending opportunity for adult education across Alberta, particularly in rural and remote areas. And they did this in many different ways as professors, books, and arts and crafts exhibits traveled around the province. At one time, they had 150 traveling libraries in wooden crates moving around from community to community, and there were 500 little theater groups supported by university extension in as many communities. Extension also used the new technology of the era, radio, starting Canada's first public radio station, CKUA, for University of Alberta. Alberta was in the midst of the Great Depression and the Environmental Dust Bowl Crisis when the U of A Department of Extension offered a summer drama course held in Banff in 1933. It was funded by the American Carnegie Foundation, committed to quality of life and culture. U of A's remarkable actor-director, Elizabeth Sterling Haynes, taught the Little Theatre School uh, taught this theater school and it drew many prairie folks who were part of a little theater movement in communities that organized arts and culture locally for quality of life where few other entertainments existed. U of A expanded its offerings to visual art in partnership with A.C. Layton's summer art schools from the Provincial Institute of Art and Technology in Calgary. Ultimately expanded, it expanded into many programs. And as you can see from the cover of this early catalog, in 1939, it expanded to include art, music, French, it expanded to include dance, handicrafts, and many other arts. And it also became a center for continuing education and offered business management programs and conferences that helped to cross subsidize the arts programs. Well, why was a public university in a public park? A school for fine arts gained national park support in Ottawa and Banff as a good fit for Banff National Park because art was seen as education and interpretation befitting the natural beauty of Canada's national parks. So the public university school of fine arts fit well with the public park mandate of the times. The same year the Banff School of Fine Arts started its theater school, the new National Parks Act was passed in Ottawa in 1933, emphasizing the new principle of inviolability along with the education and enjoyment of the people in national parks for future generations. The long-standing director of the school was Donald Cameron. He was an Innisfail farm boy, and he went to the U of A to study agriculture. 
He had a track record as a student union leader, and he was involved in rural development as a young farmer and organizer. He also went on to serve the National Film Board and as a Canadian Senator in Ottawa. As director of the Banff School, Cameron thought that the Rockies were inspiring so that Banff is an asset. Wherever they live, people feel that Banff belongs to them, he wrote. Now this almost foreshadowed a world heritage status yet to come for the mountain parks. For Cameron, his vision was to build Banff into an arts and cultural destination. He was influenced by Danish summer folk schools and ideas from Europe. He envisioned the Banff School as the Salzburg of America, as he called it. Really quite an optimistic outlook and a big dream, considering it was a sleepy mountain town. But he saw that it might become a mountain arts hub with the sound of Mozart on the mountain. And here he was, of course, referring to Salzburg, Austria, and its renowned music festival and arts attractions. So if you have seen the sound of music, and I'm sure you have, you've seen the streets of Salzburg, you've seen its mountain scenery, and you've seen its famous music festival. And as an aside, Salzburg also became a designated World Heritage Site. U of A's Banff School started out in borrowed and rented space. These were hard times. They were making the most of shared assets during the Great Depression. They used the local Banff High School, as you see here, and they collaborated with the local school board. The accommodations were in rental lodgings in Banff homes, as was common in this day. And if necessary, they even used the hallways in the school as emergency dorms. In fact, the Banff School and the university collaborated to build and um, fund and build the new school board auditorium on Banff Avenue, which is now very well known as the Parks Canada Info Centre. And into the 1950s, the Banff School continued to use space in town, such as the high school classrooms. So here we see some of the students on the front steps of the school and how it grew. The BAP School had an upsurge in post-war numbers for students and teachers and staff that coincided with the rising numbers of visitors in the post-war mountain parks. They really went from having a hundred to a couple of hundred to having almost a thousand students over the course of time. Leisure and education were opportunities for more Canadians as the middle class grew Veterans returned from war and went through rehabilitation or career retraining for reconstruction times and a more prosperous Canada. And public education was part of that shift. It expanded as did public parks. To be a tourist was also to be a citizen enjoying the benefits of prosperity in post-war Canada. By the mid 1940s, it was clear that so many were coming to the Banff School that it needed its own campus and residence halls. In fact, Banff had a scarcity of accommodation immediately uh, after the war as it was coming to an end. And even Donald and his wife, Stella Cameron, arrived in the 1940s to find they had nowhere to stay because the reservation at a lodging house had been given to someone else. So how did the Banff School come to be located on Tunnel Mountain in a prize-winning location with a million dollar view? Well, as we said, they started out on Banff Avenue in shared space in the auditorium and the, and the school. But Cameron was a good talker. He was quite good on the hustle and he negotiated with the National Parks Authority to obtain a leasehold for a new campus that would be a satellite of the U of A. Superintendent P.J. Jennings in Banff first offered a site near Whiskey Creek on boggy ground right next to the CPR railway lines. Ah, he was soon persuaded to offer a, another lot that was a little bit higher than Banff Avenue on Deer Street. Cameron persisted though. He said that the Banff School was actually a project of greater importance. 
and needed better real estate. It was a project of national importance. And Jennings was persuaded, and he and Cameron convinced Ottawa to upgrade it to a lot in the St. Julian block with its more spectacular villa lots here on the top of Tunnel Mountain. Cameron had upsold the Banff School into better real estate right across from the Banff Springs Hotel. It had the best view and sight lines up the Bow Valley all the way to the massive range and sunsets on Mount Bourgeau. This site was good as gold for the success of the future Banff School and today's Banff Centre. Cameron began looking for donors to fund the buildings. Imagining the site visually was step one. This sketch was drawn by Stanley Thompson, Canada's most famous golf course landscape architect, who had also designed the Banff Springs golf course. He agreed to make this drawing on a handshake deal with Cameron over drinks at the Mount Royal Hotel and he did it for a dollar. Well, later designs emerged from the architects rule, win, rule in Edmonton. They were graduates of the U of A's architecture school. And the first designs were in keeping with the rustic park architecture well known in the mountain parks and the chateau style of the Banff Springs Hotel. In fact, this design uh, that was proposed for a Colonel Wood Memorial Hall as the key building was also described as a miniature Banff Springs. When Cameron showed the designs to the artist instructors at the school, he was persuaded to go with a more modern approach. The artists wanted something more modern, not the Swiss rustic style or the chateau style that was common. Well, Rule turned his design this way toward international modernism. His flat-topped chalets emerged as a new trend-setting look in Banff in the 1940s. And the design process of these drawings was really very interesting to follow. Um, so this was a, one of the larger buildings he proposed in this sketch, and this was one of the smaller ones. And they all had a price tag depending on the size of the donor they would seek out. The campus architectural design was innovative for its day. It certainly set a trend and there was a whole landscape architecture around it. They wanted to build with local materials like rundlestone, for instance, and Canadian timber. Well, in the end, the first three buildings were funded by Leonora Woods, the widow of Colonel Woods, who had owned the newspaper in Calgary. And later, oilman Eric Harvey and others contributed generously, so that Calgary Capital helped to uplift the province's university and the arts, believing them both to be very important. The first three new buildings were these multi-purpose chalets. They were used for dormitories, for instruction, and their views from the sun deck looking straight down the Bow Valley was one of the things that was always highlighted. It was a prize location obtained as a leasehold in cooperation with the federal parks authorities who saw the project to be of national significance. And it's still a drawing card today and part of the Banff Center brand. And it's wonderful that these heritage buildings are still on the Banff Center campus. Well, what about life as an artist teacher? Most of the instructors at the Banff School were artist teachers. This was a concept from Britain, meaning they were committed to art and teaching the general public about art as they conveyed new ways of living and thinking. Celebrated painters such as A.Y. Jackson and other group of seven artists and Kingston's Andre Beeler were marquee attractions at the school. Joining them were prairie artists who traveled Alberta teaching art for the U of A and as contractors elsewhere. Let's look at four of these instructors and their work. And I'll just read out their names so you can uh, know who they are. There's Jock McDonald, 
Walter J. Phillips here. We have Murray McDonald, Holly Middleton, H.G. Glide, and J.B. Taylor, and James Ditchmont. And they're clearly reclining on the lawn right in front of the Banff School on Banff Avenue here in the days when there was a hardware store on the main street. So let's start out with Glide. English-born painter Henry Glyde spent 30 summers in Banff as instructor and administrator, really making the dream of a Banff art school a reality on the ground. He was head of the Department of Extension Fine Art Division from 1936 till 66. He also held extension classes in various rural towns in Alberta, and he was a muralist. Some of his murals are still at the University of Alberta in the library and elsewhere. He was a member of the Royal Canadian uh, Academy of Arts, I might also add. And I like this painting because it gives this sense of what it's like to be a teacher watching your students at work. So this would have been a little study of his students en plein air. His colleague, um, landscape painter J.B. Taylor, traveled throughout Alberta and the Northwest Territories, teaching various community art classes and workshops, including in mental hospitals and prisons in the late 1940s and early 1950s. He was on the U of A art staff in Edmonton and traveled to Vegreville, a hundred miles away every three weeks to assist with Glide's extension classes there. He found he also had to stay on his toes in order to keep up the quality of his teaching on main campus while he was going back and forth so much. He had another colleague at the U of A, painter Harry Wolfarth, who was also a member of the Alpine Club section there. And he had traveled an estimated million miles by Greyhound bus in the process of teaching extension art classes across Alberta. He taught for many years at the Banff School as well and judged art club shows and mentored students. Janet Middleton, also known as Holly, uh, taught painting at the Banff School for 23 years starting in 1948. She said she had to work very hard. She had been taught um, by and mentored by Glide and Phillips and others at the Banff School of Fine Arts. She had studied at the Winnipeg School of Art and she received a scholarship to study at the Slade School in London. So she ended up teaching U of A extension classes around the province. We found in our research that generally women were paid less than male instructors at the Banff School and some were hired to fill in last minute when big name hires from farther afield didn't pan out as planned. And this was a bit of a breakthrough for some of the instructors who might be say women in Southern Alberta and invited to come back and teach again. Now these painters, they were working together in Edmonton and at the BAMP school and they were joined by um, other faculty at the Banff School from Southern Alberta. So you had Walter J. Phillips, a watercolorist and woodblock printer. He started at the Banff School in 1940 and also worked at Calgary in Calgary at the Tech. Uh, he and painter Nora Brown taught extension courses before and after the Banff summer sessions. Such a beautiful watercolor. Now landscape art was a dominant style, but instruction also included other styles and studio work, including life drawing and painting with models. Over the years, we noticed tension surface in the correspondence records at times uh, over outdoor classes worth, uh, versus more studio work. Andre Baylor criticized Glide for spending too much time wandering around outside, as he put it, rather than teaching in what was assumed to be the more disciplined environment of the studio. But Glide, in turn, later criticized Ilda Lubain, one of his staff members, for teaching outside because she asked students to lie on the ground in the woods to find their voice and then do their painting. Well, overall, being an artist teacher was a lot of work, 
a lot of travel and squeezed family time in during the summer of paid work teaching in Banff. The Banff School generally paid less than the going rate for instructors, but Cameron often said it all evened out because they'd have a holiday at school. Now, in fact, many of the instructors did bring their family, uh, their spouses, their children with them to Banff. And you can see there was a sense of community. This was the community of the faculty members coming together at their picnic one summer. Well, what was it like to be a student on holiday and learning in Banff? Like students everywhere, they found travel fun and they liked a freebie. Going to school was a budget holiday for most. And even a Swiss student from Zurich said it was a bargain. She wrote, just like a holiday, a two month vacation at less than $5 a day, including meals and pin money. Not even in the Alps can you get such a bargain, she wrote. Many students went swimming in the cave and basin and the upper hot springs. We read that some made friends with the local Banff Springs pool attendants and were led into the hotel's guest pool as a lark and a freebie. In 1947, Victoria Gillies arrived from Alvina, Saskatchewan by CPR with her bicycle. She shared a small upstairs room crammed with three other teachers in art and piano courses attending the Banff School. She was 18 and told me that at that age, I was all for adventure and everything is an adventure. Riding around Banff town site was another great pastime. We would be on our bikes in our spare time, go up and down the streets and see how many different states and provinces license plates were from. So Banff opened a new world for her as a tourist and an art student from this small farm in Alvina, Saskatchewan, where they typically saw one license plate. Banff was a new world. She also canoed on the Bow River at Mather's Boathouse across from Peter and Catherine White's cabin and Banff Central Park. I was into sports and this was exciting. She was a physical education teacher and turning her certification toward teaching art. You did your classes, but then there was all this other activity. And Victoria Gillies later went on to raise six daughters, inculcate her love of art in them, and also adapt teaching techniques to teaching children with special needs. Uh, so she became an art teacher with children. In 1956, Robert Guest came from Beaver Lodge, Alberta. He enjoyed hiking trips to Moraine Lake, Lake Minnewanka and Lake Louise, all the usual tourist destinations with the great hiking trails for day trips. He also noted in his diary that he had attended jazz parties, once dressed up as Marilyn Monroe, who had recently been in Bath and Jasper to film The River of No Return. He spent his time sleeping in, missing breakfast, and numerous taking numerous trips into town to see movies, concerts, and performances. He also wrote in his diary that he was impressed by the Banff Indian Days Parade. Still, he worked hard on his art. Into the evening, if necessary, after hiking during the day, he would catch up. He would stay on top of his studies, such as the aesthetic perception of mountains, and he won scholarships. He was thrilled to meet leading artists and sell one or two of his works at the end of the summer, both to an artist and to a member of the public at the annual festival week. And I'll come back to that idea. This is the New Trail magazine for alumni of the U of A in 1945. And I just love this description written by Frida Smith Muddeman. She talks about French students conscientiously eschewing their native tongue. So they're trying not to speak English and I can so identify with that. Um, she says, drama students were being dramatic all the time. Hilarity in dormitory and dining room. Older students take their pleasures less strenuously. Bus rides in the evening, out to see the bears at the dump ground. The trip to Norquay Ski Camp with its magnificent view 
of the Valley of the Bull, a visit to the beavers who have turned a verdant meadow into a swamp along the highway, and one and who one evening almost completed a dam across the bow. And they also went to illustrated lectures on beauty spots in the park and the Columbia ice fields, much as you might do. And so students tried tourist life and it was also educational. Meanwhile, the Camerons were overseeing student life, much like mom and dad. And of course, many of the students would potentially have still been minors under the age of 21. And so they were uh, in loco parentis, overseeing the well being of the students, like parents. Stella Cameron, the wife of the director, was a lead figure overseeing residence life. But we can also thank her for conserving the, many of the archives of the early Banff School, which she took on as a conservation project herself. The women's residences were also supervised by matrons who were themselves teachers and social workers on a working holiday in Banff. Now the school did have a regime that demanded punctuality. You had to be on time for meals. There were communal meals in the dining room and respectable attire was expected. You had to be neat and tidy and there was no paint allowed on one's clothes or, or skin. So you had to arrive looking good and um, there were definitely no cell phones allowed at the table. But if you look at this picture, you'll see that there's also um, a, a whole service underway here to deliver meals to the table for hundreds of students. And this also highlights how the staff of the BAMP school was a veritable army of servers, cooks, dishwashers, chambermaids and groundskeepers and that the Banff School was a job maker as well as we realized the labor of these workers at the school making all of this happen. Demographically students were largely women with a ratio of about three to one. Um, and this led to holding dances and events with the Banff cadet camps, the army cadet camp that was up the road. So if you have a look at this image, you'll see that they're having some great fun swinging and jiving, but there are also all of those rather awkward moments of wallflowers sitting along here. And up on the wall are various works of art on display. So this is still an educational opportunity in a social environment. Women were typically streamed more toward teaching, um, school teaching and working with children or in rehabilitation at times, whereas the males tended to be streamed more toward professional and commercial artist careers, although many did actually become teachers too. Typically, students were more often Caucasian, but included persons of color, indigenous peoples, Japanese Canadians, and we found some enrollment drawing from American Negro colleges as they were termed. International recruitment also drew from the USA and overseas, including India, Sweden, Switzerland, Australia, and in the 1950s, African countries. And internationalism was on the rise through the 1950s as an educational trend. Students tended to be middle-class and urban, but others were rural and from across the prairies and farther afield. Scholarships from local art clubs and community organizations helped to attend the school in many cases. Likewise, businesses donated to scholarships at the BAB school that were branded with their corporate and company names, including many Banff businesses. So let's talk now about branding Banff. Of course, Banff was not new to branding, as we know from the CPR, which gave its own name to the Rockies in its promotional material starting in the 19th century. But the Banff School also came to brand Banff. And here we have the cover of Canada's Mountain Playgrounds, a much published brochure of the National Parks Department out of Ottawa. On the cover, we see reframed 
a photo image of a Banff school class at the Hoodoos in Banff, just looking down toward the Bow River here. And I'm sure many of you recognize this image. So how did this come to be on the cover of Canada's Mountain Playgrounds, branding Banff as the Banff School? It actually started with the National Film Board taking a lot of still photos during a film shoot at the school. Donald Cameron received them. And when the National Parks Department reached out to him for some typical photos, they made a selection of the images that they thought would be suitable and sent them to Ottawa. And in turn, it returned on the cover of this promotional material that was reprinted uh, more than once and in hundreds and hundreds of copies in the early 1950s. And so Canada's mountain playground started to look a lot like the BAM school because they were interested in having an image of youthful figures engaged in active, colorful activities in the outdoors at this time in order to brand the national parks as playgrounds. And this brochure was part of a larger series of playground brochures featuring national parks from coast to coast. So Canada's ocean playgrounds was one for Atlantic Canada. This one was focused on the Rockies. We can also see that the catalogs published by the University of Alberta for the Banff School, and you see the U of A um, coat of arms here on the front cover in 1956, featured images that were in a lot of ways tourism images. So wildlife, teepees, it seems like Banff Indian days, the Norquay lifts, and Lake Louise are all featured here, much like uh, postcard or calendar images, but it's interspersed with pictures of the arts and the modern buildings of the new campus. And so the image of the Banff School is also a kind of holiday image, uh, refracting and reflecting some of the tourism uh, visuals of this era. Cameron constantly asserted that summer art school was not summer camp, it was not about fun and frolic, but it was about rigor and academic standards. One instructor, William Townsend, actually suggested to him that the school calendar ought to have less Vermilion Lake, only one picture of Vermilion Lake, and more emphasis on the quality of teachers and modern facilities. Yet the drawing card and the marketing brand was still postcard images and sites typical of Banff and attractive students portraying having a holiday at school. And that was the name of the NFB film that was made on location in 1945 and issued the following year. Holiday at school portrayed the students golfing and riding horses at the Banff stables and hiking at Moraine Lake all of it seen as a wonderful outdoor classroom and an inspirational brand that included artists as tourists and artists as tourist attractions in the mountain beauty spots in a place where artists were part of the landscape and became part of the destination branding of Banff. The tourist gaze was thus seen from all directions and helped to brand Banff. And so here we are at the Valley of Ten Peaks and Moraine Lake, could be a postcard shot, and we have the students doing their painting on plein air. Moreover, some of the students, like Margaret Shelton, made saleable prints as tourism mementos based on their travels through the park. And Shelton was a real adventurer. She lived with her parents in Rosedale, Alberta, in the Drumheller Valley, and rode her bike to get to Banff and all throughout the mountain parks. And so these were some of the limited edition prints that she made of well-known tourism destinations, such as Castle Mountain and the Upper Hot Springs. And they're very colorful, and I really like the sense of motion in this one of a St. George's Church in Banff with Tunnel Mountain in the background. So seeing as an artist and while being a tourist, she was able to conceive of these works. Now the final week of every BAM school was a festival week. And this was the opportunity for the school to throw open its doors and invite the public in. For the public to see exhibits on Main Street as we see here 
to hear concerts by the musicians, the students in music programs, and to listen to lectures by artist teachers, which again highlights the principle of teaching art to the general public as part of adult education. This was instilled in them and how they worked. The BAP School evolved into a professional training and continuing education center and emerged autonomous as the BAP Center in 1978. This institution has been a remarkable success and an intergenerational legacy for almost 90 years. Public education and public parks were an engine for social enrichment and the economy, branding Banff as a cultural destination, much like Cameron's dream for Salzburg in the Canadian Rockies. Its teachers and students were also tourists and became part of the Banff Mountain brand and learning tourism. Looking forward, it's often said that education is the new buffalo in a knowledge economy in Alberta and globally also invaluable are special places, including the eastern slopes of the Canadian Rockies and the main ranges for art, learning, and renewal on the land. As the past suggests, whether in times of turmoil or prosperity, we need to invest in the arts and education and parks because they propel thinking forward with hope and uplift the people. Thank you.